Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society. Dr. Shanafeld? Hi, I'm Tate Shanafeld. I'm a hematologist at Stanford University. And Dr. Shanafeld, you've done a lot of work in CLL, but you've also been involved in looking at something that a lot of patients are looking at, which is... Is there something I can do in terms of taking a supplement, something I can help myself to improve my outcomes in CLL? And there's been a lot of work on green tea extract and there are curcumin, but I think the one that's risen to the top and recently there was a very important article on blood advances in terms of the role of vitamin D in CLL and how that might affect outcomes. And this is, can you first set the scene for us in terms of what the background research that you and your colleagues back at Mayo did and your take on what this research that's recently published should mean for patients? Are there action points for patients? No, th thanks, Brian. It, it is a really interesting story. And uh, we've known for some time that people who have low levels of vitamin D, which is about 40% of adults in the United States, are at increased risk for a, a number of uh, types of uh, cancer, including lymphoid malignancies. But data also uh, suggested that once a cancer develops, that individuals with low vitamin D often in, uh, can have more rapid cancer progression. And as some of that early data was coming out uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, we looked at a, a large cohort of patients at Mayo Clinic who had newly diagnosed CLL uh, and for whom we had stored samples and assessed their vitamin D levels and looked at the relationship between the vitamin D level and how their CLL behaved. And in that group, since they were all newly diagnosed uh, early stage patients, we were mainly looking at, was there any relationship between lower levels of vitamin D and more rapid CLL progression? And in essence, what we found is that there was indeed a, a strong relationship between low levels of vitamin D and more rapid CLL progression, independent of all of our traditional CLL prognostic markers. Uh, such that it wasn't just associated with, you know, fish or IGBH or some other parameter that independent of those, it was associated with more rapid progression. We validated that in a second independent cohort of CLL patients found the exact same phenomena and the, the magnitude of relationship between vitamin D and progression was almost identical between those two studies, uh, suggesting that there are potentially prognostic implications to having low levels of vitamin D. Uh, after we published that, Stefano Malika and the, uh, one of the Italian groups actually validated that finding in a third group of CLL patients. And what I think is, you know, in part makes the finding quite interesting is that uh, normal blood producing cells express the vitamin D receptor, normal lymphocytes express the vitamin D receptor, and CLL cells express that vitamin D receptor even more strongly than normal B cells. There's been studies looking at using high doses of vitamin D analogs in the test tube in vitro uh, and looking at the effects on CLL cells, and it causes the death of CLL cells. And so there's this interesting biologic plausibility that this isn't just an observation of low vitamin D levels in CLL progression, but those cells actually express that receptor. And when we treat them in the test tube with vitamin D, it can uh, invoke CLL cell death. So all of that sort of sets the stage for this question of, should we be thinking about vitamin D as a potential uh, early intervention for asymptomatic patients 
in that mo active monitoring phase of, of CLL. And, and I'll say that in, in my own practice and a, a number of the colleagues involved with that paper, testing vitamin D levels is something we do in every newly diagnosed patient and have been doing for more than a decade after those initial data came out. The standard approach for all human beings, whether you have CLL or not, if you find a, a, a deficiency or a low level of vitamin D, to replace it and bring it up to just normal levels. Uh, but there, beyond case reports, and there are some case reports of people who had had CLL for a time, started taking vitamin D and had some CLL regression. There, there hadn't been, uh, you know, additional evidence to sort of ask the question of does supplementation with vitamin D sort of reverse that adverse association of low light vitamin D and CLL progression. So what you're saying is we had good evidence that if your vitamin D level was low, you did less well with CLL. We had very weak or almost no evidence that if taking a vitamin D supplement could reverse that. But th is that different now with this paper? And what what's your take? I know you've written an editorial on that. And this is an area that's, over a decade you've been thinking about. Yeah, it, it this new paper uh, by uh, Dr. Tadmor and uh, the Israeli group is uh, provides some interesting, provocative new data uh, uh, related to this question. And, and they use their national database to look at a large group of newly diagnosed CLL patients and identify using that registry, which individuals with newly diagnosed CLL were taking vitamin D supplements and which were not. And the long and the short of it is that they did find that those individuals who were taking supplements appeared to have a longer time between their CLL diagnosis and the time that they had progressed to the point that they needed treatment for the CLL. And the, you know, the interesting uh, second piece was that to, to sort of control for the possibility that people taking supplements are just individuals more attuned to healthy living, healthy lifestyle. Uh, so is it not really a an intervention, but it's just a marker of people attending to their health more rigorously? People who take vitamin D maybe exercise more, or eat more of a plant-based diet or, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly right. And, and as a, a you know a quasi control for that, they said, well, let's look at use of a different vitamin supplement and see if we see the same effect, which would be a partial control for that sort of healthy lifestyle effect. So they looked at whether people taking vitamin C supplements had the same phenomena of slower CLL progression, and they did not. So there appeared to be some specificity that this was linked specifically to vitamin D supplementation. They didn't, you know, one important point in the paper, they didn't have baseline pre-start of vitamin D levels, vitamin D levels in all patients. And so there's always a, a really important question when we're looking at trials of supplements is are we replacing a deficiency, a vitamin deficiency, or are we supplementing or augmenting people who have normal levels? And over the arc of studies in cancer of many types over the years, what the trials have usually shown is that supplementation does not offer benefit. And in fact, in some cases, beta carotene and lung cancer, it can be harmful. And so I do think there's always this important distinction that we're not necessarily trying to have people reach ultra high levels, the data, at least around CLL, is that it's the deficiency that seems to be associated or insufficiency associated with this more rapid CLL progression. In the in the Tadmor trial, we don't have perfect data to really say how many of these folks were replacing a deficiency versus augmenting or supplementing. But again, more suggestive evidence that not only is low levels of are low levels of vitamin D associated with more rapid progression, but potentially that replacing those low levels to bring things into the normal range 
might actually reverse that association. So to be clear, this was for people in active surveillance or watch and wait. This is not for somebody who's, let's say, in therapy or in a, a remission that not that it, we, it's not that we don't know that it, the, the reality is we don't know if it'll work. We don't know that it doesn't work, but we also don't know if it does work in that circumstance. But this was only looking at tr essentially treatment naive patients. That's correct. In the in the uh, in the Israeli trial, um, there there has been other data. Uh, when we had uh, looked at that uh, original uh, study in CLL at Mayo Clinic, the lymphoma group uh, at Mayo had looked at vitamin D levels in a whole host of other lymphoid malignancies, and found some of not all, but some other specific types of lymphoma also had a similar association of low vitamin D levels and progression. Some of those other tumor types are ones we always treat immediately. And so there have subsequently been some trials looking at, well, what if you gave the traditional chemotherapy or other treatments by itself, or you added vitamin D replacement to it as an adjunct? And there have been, you know, some mixed reports on that, but there are some meta-analysis saying that it might be good in that setting to make sure you're replacing the vitamin D, not as the primary treatment, as you're noting, but as an, an adjunct. So I think uh, there's some suggestive data and other lymphomas, that, but again, you're making a really important point that when you reach the point you need treatment, this wouldn't be a substitute for our more you know, standard targeted therapies uh, could be considered uh, maybe an adjunct of just making sure you have normal levels. We want that for all human beings. Let, let me ask you something, and I know the plural of anecdotes is not data, but I sure hear from a lot of patients and my own experience is that I have to take very high doses of vitamin D to be replete, to have a normal level. I take 5,000 international units of D3 a day, and I'm not unusual in that, where the recommendations are much lower than that. Other people don't take that. Is is is? Do we know anything? Is that just n n nonsense, or is there any data on that? Is there any understanding about that, or is is that a real phenomena? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that I have a direct answer to your question of do individuals with CLL require higher levels of replacement uh, to, to kind of bring things back than individuals who don't have CLL. Uh, I'm not aware of any data on that. We did publish a, a study at Mayo Clinic. Uh, uh, Matthew Drake was the first author. I, I can forward that citation your way, Brian, in which we just looked at people who were deficient and used sort of a standard approach uh, to replace them and uh, you know, sort of use higher doses uh, of treatment weekly for six weeks. And then if you weren't replete, sort of double and, and go for another increment of time, that it worked very well, right? That we can use that standard approach. Not everyone needs the same amount, but that we can typically get everybody into that, back into that normal range. Uh, but you, you're right. I, I have to say for many of my patients, I, I do see that they do have and have to go above that sort of traditional 800 or 1,000 international units a day um, to, to get things into the normal range. And so um, I think it's one of those areas where talk to your doctor, think about if your level is low, what would be the starting dose? And then you can recheck and see if you've achieved the, the level of repletion you want. I, I think the one other maybe word of caution, um, vitamin D is one of several vitamins that is fat soluble and that those type of vitamins your body doesn't have a good way to get rid of the extra so whereas some vitamins if you're taking too much your kidneys will just excrete it vitamin d you can in a sense overdose and so you, this is one of those areas too you don't want to just start on a high dose never have levels checked you can sort of overshoot and that can cause a different set of problems. And, and so important to, you know, have the level checked as you start replacement, you know, work with your doctor to kind of monitor to make sure that you're getting the right things adjusted for the right dose for, for your own situation.
And I would add too, that there's been more research that uh, people with CLL of itself and some of the treatments for CLL can affect bone health. So making sure that your vitamin D level is adequate is something that can help because we have a higher incidence of osteoporosis and other problems. So um, there, there's a lot of good reasons uh, to be uh, making sure having your vitamin D level checked on a regular basis. And, and uh, it's not just a one and done. It needs to be checked on a regular basis if you're supplementing. Yeah, that, that's right. That's, that's a good point. Any final thoughts or anything that you want to share with patients or any takeaways? Or is this going to change how you, you your, your next patient walks in and says, I, I was just got diagnosed with CLL, uh, Dr. Shanafeld, um, should I start on vitamin D? Is this going to change how you approach things? It, uh, it won't change my practice because I've been doing that for over a decade, as again, have many of my colleagues who, who have been part of this uh, uh, field of study. But it does, I think, provide further suggestive evidence that that is a, a, a worthy thing to do. And I think probably will provide additional data that may encourage more folks to include, a, you know, testing of vitamin D as a standard initial laboratory for newly diagnosed CLL patients or patients that they're uh, caring for who have CLL. And again, I think, is this definitive evidence that replacement reverses things in CLL? It, it's not, but uh, again, we know that about 40% of adults are deficient. And if they're seen by their primary care doctor and they're deficient, we would be replacing them anyway as standard good medical practice for bone health and other things, as you note. And so I think there's reason to say we're on a, a solid footing doing that as part of general medical care. And there continues to be with this article being the next in a, this series of uh, a studies saying there may be a two for one benefit uh, and that it can help the CLL as well. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe conclude with a comment, uh, being a, a, a clinical trialist myself, but you know, obviously randomized trials are sort of our coin of the realm level of evidence to know with certainty whether this works is that what's needed here? I'll, I can tell you, we started exactly such a trial over a decade ago at Mayo Clinic. It's still open and it just is very hard to accrue. Even though that trial looked at um, testing levels and replacing immediately versus replacing levels after a, a time delay to sort of uh, evaluate whether we saw effects on lymphocyte count progression and other things, that it just is hard both for an individual patient and the treating doctor, if we find a level that's low, it, it's hard not to act on it. And, and so I, I make that point that we do need further studies, but I'm not sure we're ever gonna have the definitive trial to answer this question because we've been trying to do it for a decade and it's just a very challenging thing to do when we're in a situation where outside of the context of CLL, when we know a patient has deficiency, our standard approach is to replace. No, I, I understand the ethics of that. It's the classic, you know, you, there's never been a clinical trial that shows that jumping out of a plane with or without a parachute, you know, how do you randomize for that? You know, so it's sort of the classic example. Uh, Dr. Shanafelt, um, I always learn something when I talk with you. I'm so grateful for the research you and your colleagues are doing. Um, um, thank you so much for this very uh, clear and helpful context of this, I think, important research. Absolutely. Great to be with you, Brian. Great to see you.